Afternoon, everybody. Apologies for being a little tardy uh, today. Um, still starting early than what we're used to, so I guess that's a good thing. Um, I have two very, very brief things, uh, and then I'm happy to dive right into your questions. So first, uh, this morning, the Secretary of State, together with the President of the World Food Prize Foundation, announced the 2023 World Food Prize Laureate. Uh, the World Food Prize is considered the preeminent award for global agriculture and celebrates breakthrough achievements in combating hunger and enhancing food security around the world. This year's winner is American Heidi Kuhn, founder and CEO of the nonprofit Roots of Peace, which works to transform heavily mined areas into sustainable agricultural farmland. Since its establishment, Roots of Peace has facilitated the removal of 100,000 landmines and unexploded ordinances and strengthened food security in local communities in Afghanistan, Angola, Croatia, Guatemala, Israel, uh, the Palestinian territories, and Vietnam, among others. We offer her congratulations and gratitude for this critical work. The world is facing a global food security crisis of historic proportions, a combination of climate shocks and regional conflicts, including Russia's illegal war against Ukraine, have disrupted global food production and distribution, driving up the cost of feeding people and families and disproportionately impacting those in developing countries. The U.S. is committed to addressing this crisis and working with the world to build resilient food systems that support local communities. Uh, and secondly, I wanted to offer an update on Sudan, specifically the talks that are uh, ongoing in Jeddah. Uh, Assistant Secretary Molly Fee uh, and Ambassador John Godfrey are leading the U.S. delegation to the Jeddah talks, which are ongoing and are focused on establishing the commitment of the two parties to recognize their obligations under international humanitarian law and to agree to arrangements to allow the safe delivery of humanitarian assistance and the restoration of essential services. In this process, we will continue to engage and press for the effective short-term ceasefire to facilitate humanitarian assistance. The talks that are ongoing in Jeddah enjoy broad support from the AU, uh, the IGAD tripartite mechanism, countries in the region, and many Sudanese civilian groups have also issued supportive statements. Uh, the pre-negotiation talks uh, contribute to the goals and intent of the AU's April 20th communique and support the AU's forthcoming roadmap to de-escalation. These talks are a course a first step and more broadly we continue to engage Sudanese civilian leaders, resistance committees, and civil society to work towards the shared goal of establishing civilian democratic governance in Sudan as soon as possible and to harmonize civilian and international assistance efforts. Uh, with that, Matt, if you'd like to right. yes. kick us off. Thanks. Uh, I got a couple, but I don't think you'll have any substantive answer to any of them, so they'll be very brief, I promise. Just uh, first on your Sudan statement, what exactly is your understanding of what pre-negotiation talks are? What, what does that mean? Matt, the work is ongoing to uh, ensure that... Yeah, I know it is, but what the hell does that mean, pre-negotiation talks? They're either talks, they're negotiations, or they're not. What we are working towards, and you can assign uh, any vocabulary that no, you but like. But you assigned uh, it. I'm not and, assigning and, any. And, I, I'm not assigning any. Of it. And I so just can we? Know what is your understanding of this? What, what is, it what supposed this to is about? If, at the end of this, if it is successful, at the end of these pre-negotiation talks, are there supposed to be negotiations? Are there supposed to be talks? What this what, is about is what, what, is. I, doesn't make any sense. Th what this is about, Matt, is about taking further steps to see a reduction in violence, to see uh, steps being taken for a ceasefire to yeah, be uh, extended and adhered all, all to. All of that as well. All, of, good, us, all of which to get to an ultimate cessation of hostilities. That's what this is yeah, about. All of that is well and good, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Pre-negotiation talks. They're either talks, they're negotiations, or they're not. Anyway, um, I, I want to ask you something I know you're going to defer to justice on. Prove me wrong. Do you have any comment on the, extradition, uh, the uh, extradition from Peru on the uh, suspect in the Natalie Ho Holloway case? And w was there any um, State Department involvement in 
Uh, to your uh, surprise, Matt, the, and as you know, as a uh, matter of longstanding policy, the Department of State does not comment on uh, pending uh, extradition uh, matters, and so I don't have anything additional for you on that. All right. And then before my colleagues ask you unanswerable questions about China and Pakistan, uh, I will just ask you about Israel and Gaza. Has there been any – we saw that uh, Jake Sullivan spoke with the Israeli, his Israeli counterpart last night about the situation. Uh, has there been any State Department engagement? There certainly has been uh, State Department engagement. Uh, uh, the department uh, uh, included many who work on these issues, from Assistant Secretary Barbara Leaf to Ambassador Nides, have continued to remain engaged on this. I don't have any uh, specific uh, calls from the Secretary to read out or preview, but obviously uh, we continue to call on uh, both sides to uh, take steps uh, that will uh, not uh, incite tensions and uh, uh, further incite violence, and of course uh, would ask uh, all sides to take prudent steps to ensure that civilian life uh, is not harmed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Are you up with the same issue? Um, is that okay, John? On, on Gaza? Gaza? Go ahead, I mean, Said. Uh, I am surprised that, uh, to, today that you didn't really have anything to say on what's going on in Gaza. The Israeli, you know, broke a, a, an agreement or a ceasefire, and they killed children. I mean, they killed children in the middle of the night while they were sleeping. Girls and boys. Five of them, and you had nothing to say on that. And the other thing, uh, Zidane, today marks the one-year anniversary of the assassination of an occupying army of an American Palestinian journalist. And you have nothing to say on this either. So can you update us on both issues? I mean, I, I, aside from the stuff that you said to Matt, we want to hear what is the United States government's position on what Israel did in Gaza in the middle of the night, killing children while they were sleeping. And the second, update us on what's going on with the investigation on accountability of those responsible for the killing of Shireen Abak. Said, let me, uh, let me, let me um, say a couple things. Uh, first, uh, we condemned Shireen's killing uh, when it happened uh, a year ago, and we condemn it uh, today as well. Uh, and we continue to uh, pursue accountability uh, to ensure uh, that steps are taken to prevent uh, similar tragedy, tragedies from occurring in the future. And we continue to engage when it comes to rules of engagement, uh, not just with our Israeli partners, but others uh, in other regions where journalists may find themselves in harm's way. Uh, we continue to underscore the importance of accountability when it comes to uh, her killing. Uh, but Said, I will also note that, uh, and we've spoken about this before, that both the findings uh, from uh, the IDF as well as the uh, findings uh, we discussed last summer uh, from the U.S. Security Coordinator uh, continue to indicate that there was not an intentionality to this very tragic, tragic incident uh, and that we continue to, to still condemn. Uh, but I think that is an important piece of this to remember, Said. Uh, number, uh, going back to the first part of your question, we have continued to call on both sides, on both uh, uh, the, our, our Israeli partners and the Palestinian Authority to uh, take prudent steps to ensure the loss of civilian life uh, is prevented. Uh, and that steps are taken uh, to uh, ensure that violence is uh, reduced and these kinds of actions don't happen. Of course, the reporting that we're seeing from overnight is uh, tragic and heartbreaking, uh, but that is exactly why we continue to pursue uh, uh, our efforts for a, a negotiated two-state solution and why we continue to pursue uh, a, a goal of equal measures of prosperity, security, and freedom for Israelis uh, and Palestinians. Well, let me just follow up on Shireen's case. So you can tell that case is closed. As far as this department is concerned, case is over. It's closed, right? Are, are you I mean, talking? That's what you were saying. You say that you accept the findings. Said, you know? we have nev we will never forget about Shireen uh, and her tragic we death not, we, and no the, the forget, circumstances right? around it. But to us, pursuing accountability, uh, what that looks like is continuing to work 
with our Israeli partners, with partners around the world, partners in places where journalists find themselves in harm's way, discussing these very important issues of rules of engagement and ensuring that steps are being taken collectively to ensure that uh, uh, civilian risk and the risk to journalists is mitigated. That is what accountability to us uh, looks like, and we will continue to, to, to work on these matters. Okay, so on this particular case, you know, with the indulgence of my colleague and you, of course, on this particular case, what would you tell Shireen's family today? Where are we with this process? Is there going to be further uh, probing of this issue by the United States of America, or is it over? That's it. I mean, we, you have to live with it. It's tragic. It's sorry that it happened and so on. We'll make sure that it does not happen again. Although the Israelis have killed 22 Palestinian journalists thus far, but we don't want to go into there. What would you tell Shireen's family today? Said, Shireen's family uh, has experienced something tragic. Um, something horrific, and that is losing uh, a family member and, and losing a loved one uh, in any, uh, in, in any w uh, way is a uh, tragic, sad, unfortunate, and heartbreaking thing. Uh, and so I'm just not going to uh, engage on that from here. What I will reiterate again is that uh, the United States will continue to pursue uh, accountability, will continue to work with uh, our partners in the region with Israel on rules of engagement, on steps that are taken to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Any, any, uh, any follow-up on uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen's letter to the Secretary of State? I just don't have any updates on internal um, uh, U.S. government uh, documents. Sean, Can I just go follow uh, briefly on one of your responses? So you said that you're calling for um, prudent steps to ensure the loss of civilian life is prevented. Uh, Joseph Burrell, the EU uh, foreign policy chief today, called for uh, an immediate comprehensive ceasefire. This seems like, is that also something the United States supports? Does the, support, does the, United, States want to, does the United States want a ceasefire? Is it working toward that? I, I've not seen the specific um, uh, reporting of, of High Commissioner Burrell's uh, comments, but uh, certainly uh, any steps that we can take or that the two sides can adhere to as it relates to a reduction of violence uh, or steps that can be taken to prevent uh, a loss of civilian life, uh, of course, would be a positive uh, and welcome step. Can I switch topics unless somebody wants to? Anything else on this before uh, on, on, on before we, um, I think you're good sure. to change topics. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, can I switch to uh, Ukraine and South Africa? Sure. Um, the um, uh, Ambassador Brigidi today made um, uh, allegations that that Russia has delivered um, aircraft. He, that he said that 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 uh, there's, there's that South Africa has delivered weapons to to, uh, to Russia. Maybe there's some more nuance to that. Uh, the South Africans, in turn, have said that they're disappointed that he went public with this. Could you explain a little bit more of the the allegations about why the United States feels that this is that this happened and the decision to go public? Does it uh, does will it affect the relationship with South Africa? Uh, what I will say, Sean, is that we remain committed to uh, our affirmative agenda of our bilateral relationship with South Africa, uh, one that is focused on the priorities the two governments share, priorities that the recent high-level delegation to Washington discussed. Uh, these include issues of global peace and security, uh, further growing the robust trade relationship, working together on shared a shared health agenda, finding uh, ways in which uh, we, the United States, can be helpful to South Africa's energy challenges through a just transition of renewable sources of energy, as well as uh, continued partnerships on uh, work as it relates to addressing climate change. Uh, that being said, Sean, uh, as we have previously said, the U.S. Uh, has serious concerns about the docking of a r sanctioned Russian cargo vessel at a South African naval port uh, in December of last year. And as good partners do, uh, we have raised those concerns directly uh, with multiple South African officials, and I will, uh, I will leave it at that. Could you say a little bit more about Sure, a little bit more about what you think was actually transferred. And I'm just not going to get into that uh, from here, Sean. Uh, again, what I will reiterate, and this is not something new that the U.S. government has said, is that uh, we have serious concerns about uh, the docking of a sanctioned Russian vessel at uh, a South African naval port in December of last year. Just, what, just one more note. So just one more attempt at that. Um, sure. In terms of the motivation for this, I mean, do you see this as a, as a purely covert activity, perhaps not with knowledge or do you see the South Africa actually cooperating and actually giving a, 
supporting Russia. I, I'm not going to offer an assessment to that from here. Uh, what I will say is that we have been quite uh, clear and have not parsed words about um, any country uh, taking steps to uh, support uh, uh, Russia's uh, illegal and brutal uh, war in Ukraine, and we will continue to uh, engage with uh, partners and, and countries on, on this topic, but I'm, I just am not going to offer an assessment on that from here. Let me, because you had a follow-up, then I'll come to you, Simon, I promise. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the South Africans have asked that the U.S. provide evidence or intelligence, release the intelligence uh, supporting the ambassador's claims. Is that something that the U.S. is going to consider? I just don't have anything additional to offer on this, uh, uh, given the, the since the reporting this morning, and so um, don't have any. I don't want to speculate on uh, additional steps. All right, Simon, go ahead. Um, I mean, just wanted to sort of probe why the ambassador uh, is out there speaking so strongly about this, whereas you are not able to sort of, you know, why, why, why is the ambassador saying different things to what you're saying? Is, is there a disconnect between the U.S. ambassador to South Africa and what the State Department um, think, believes about, about what happened with this ship? Simon, uh, the, I'm just not going to uh, get into uh, how I am talking about something or how uh, one of our colleagues uh, is talking about an issue. Uh, what I will reiterate, though, is that, one, uh, we continue to be committed to our affirmative agenda with uh, our South African partners, and we are focused on the priorities that we share between uh, our two governments. I've outlined a number of those, uh, but also we continue to uh, be concerned about uh, the that a docking of a sanctioned uh, Russian vessel took place at a South African naval port. And we'll continue to engage on this directly with uh, our South African partners, but uh, with uh, allies and partners uh, across the world as well. Um, you mentioned the, the high-level South African delegation that was here. I, I, I couldn't see um, uh, the State Department that the State Department put out specific uh, readouts from, from that visit. Is there anything you can tell us about um, the purpose of, of that visit, uh, led by um, the National Security Advisor to the South African President, um, and specifically was the uh, South African, um, uh, the, the role of AGOA with, um, with, with regard to trade with South Africa, was that, was that something that was discussed? I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of, of, of these diplomatic meetings, but what I will say is that uh, a number of topics were discussed, including uh, global peace and security, uh, furthering the robust trade relationship uh, that we have with South Africa, and of course uh, I, I have no doubt that uh, AGOA was discussed in that context as well, uh, as well as continuing to work together on uh, shared on the shared health agenda as well, uh, as well as the numerous energy and climate issues that I, I mentioned also. And just one more, the um, South African response to this is, is to say that they're gonna, um, there's going to be an investigation into, into what happened with this ship. Uh, is that, does that satisfy uh, the serious concerns that you have? It, it certainly would be a, a welcome uh, step, but uh, again, uh, you know, the deeply concerning piece of this is the, uh, the docking of a uh, sanctioned Russian vessel at a, a South African uh, naval port. So. Um, Go ahead, Alex. There's a certain uh, pattern we have. We have seen South Africa and other countries in Africa have been blaming the U.S. on, you know, when it comes to, you know, Black Sea grain deal, not only about arming Russia. I'm just wondering how much does this indicate that uh, U.S. have been failing in terms of making the case in that topic? Uh, Alex, I, I would point you no further than the UN uh, vote that was held uh, on this in, in, in the clear condemnation of Russia's aggression in Ukraine, in which more than 140 countries spoke in unison uh, about uh, uh, Russia's uh, barbaric and unjust and unlawful actions in Ukraine. Countries that, uh, if many of which are from uh, that region and uh, the African continent and uh, are watching how um, uh, the U.S. Uh, as well as its allies and partners in, engage on this. And it, since you've given me the, the opportunity on the Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, 
it is unfortunate that uh, Moscow has continued to use and has continued to weaponize grain and hunger in a way that has forced the Black Sea Grain Initiative uh, to be needed in the first place. It shouldn't have been needed, uh, but it is exactly uh, because of this mechanism that has allowed for uh, grain uh, to get to the places that it has needed, including uh, many final destinations uh, on the African continent as well. How do you explain the fact that we keep hearing you know, South Africa and other countries uh, blaming the U.S. of you know, double standards? Is it a reflection of strong Russian propaganda? Or, or, or what uh, I don't think we're hearing uh, uh, people uh, blame, blame the U.S. Uh, again, oh, the United States has taken prudent steps to show uh, leadership uh, on uh, Russia's unjust and barbaric uh, invasion in Ukraine. Uh, it has done so in a number of steps, in taking steps to hold the Russian Federation accountable uh, through sanctions, through export controls, uh, and doing so in a way uh, that has uh, ensured that humanitarian uh, materials and goods uh, are, are, are still able to flow freely. Uh, we have also taken steps in conjunction with allies and partners to support our Ukrainian partners to ensure that they can defend themselves, defend their territorial integrity and sovereignty, as well as reclaim territory that has been taken from them. Uh, we've also uh, seen a number of countries, including the United States, step up uh, in the humanitarian space as well. Uh, uh, offering and providing humanitarian goods as well as uh, taking an active role in uh, the in accepting and welcoming uh, refugees uh, uh, and displaced people from Ukraine as well. So, Jenny, go ahead. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Bedan. Uh, Korea and China. Uh, Chinese, uh, China is uh, threatening South Korea with uh, economic retaliation again pointing out a third missile and the strengthen of the U.S. and LOK alliance. What would the United States do to counter China's economic retaliation against its allies? Well, we uh, are certainly not going to preview or uh, get ahead of any actions or designations from here, uh, but we will continue to work in lockstep uh, with our allies and partners in the region and across the world, including uh, the Republic of Korea, uh, and we'll continue to take uh, prudent steps that we believe uh, are integral to uh, peace, prosperity, and stability in the Indo-Pacific region and uh, around the world. And we, you've seen us done to do so uh, quite clearly. Uh, the most recent state visit uh, that the uh, administration hosted, in which we hosted the Republic of Korea and President Yoon. You saw a number of steps uh, and uh, active policies come out of that, including the Washington Declaration, and so we'll continue uh, to pursue those lines of efforts. Do you think uh, it is necessary to establish a U.S. ROK Japan Alliance consultative group to respond to China's economic retaliation? There are, of course, benefits to working these issues uh, in a bilateral mechanism. There is, of course, benefit to working these issues trilaterally as well. Uh, we uh, have important close partnerships with both the ROK uh, and Japan. We also have uh, important work uh, to be done in the trilateral auspice as well. Uh, Secretary Blinken has had the opportunity to engage with his foreign minister counterparts, both in a bilateral setting uh, as well as trilaterally, uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for yep. From Airway News, uh, Pakistan. Uh, there is a political un unrest in Pakistan since long, and uh, after the arrest of foreign prime minister Imran Khan, we have seen some charged crowds attacking on the military uh, offices and their homes. Uh, how Washington observing the situation in Pakistan? Well, we continue to monitor the situation in Pakistan closely, and as the U.S. has said before, uh, we don't have a position on uh, one candidate or one political party versus another. Uh, what our interest is is a uh, is a um, safe and secure, uh, prosperous Pakistan. That is an interest of the U.S.-Pakistan relations, uh, and we call for the respect of democratic principles and the rule of law around the world. Uh, the government of Pakistan also shutting down um, social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and others. And uh, there are some strict restrictions on Pakistani media channels, uh, like uh, what to show and what not. 
uh, when State Department officials engage with the Pakistani authorities, is this subject as a part of discussion, media freedom? Well, this is something that the secretary has emphasized pretty clearly before. He has been clear that access to information and diverse ideas make for a more prosperous and democratic society. And access to internet connection, for example, uh, it connects the public to information they need to advocate for themselves, to communicate with one another, to make informed decisions, to hold government officials accountable, and to exercise their freedom of expression. The one last question. Uh, many analysts believe uh, in Washington that you Due to the rifts, rifts in Pakistani military and uh, growing extremism and the political unrest uh, posed a big threat to the safety of Pakistani nuclear assets. Um, I mean, does U.S. government uh, also have same concerns or you think that they are perfectly in safe hands? Uh, there's no, uh, I, I'm just not going to uh, speculate on that. That is a, some, something internal uh, to, to Pakistan. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the same thing, but I want to understand it because I heard this from Mr. Kirby as well that uh, the U.S. wants a stable Pakistan. And the other day I heard from Karine as well when she said that uh, we don't have a favorite candidate and you said this as well today. But I am just personally trying to wonder if, the, if stability is really like uh, the U.S. is appreciating it or not because um, you have a prime minister who runs two of the largest cancer hospitals in the world, who takes millions of donations from the U.S. every year. And then you have another prime minister who was convicted on the Panama Papers, and journalists have been killed since last one year in Pakistan. Uh, media, his colleague, uh, my colleague was just asking a question earlier, Jan Zaid. I mean, the U.S. has no stand on these things, but they, Favorite, like you have no favorite <laughs> candidate, we understand that, but like the U.S. is not taking any stand on some of the uh, atrocities which has taken place since last one year. Uh, I would reject the the, 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 the the premise of your question. I let, let me say a couple things. That is true. We do not have a favored candidate or a favored political party, um, not just um, in Pakistan, but as it relates to any uh, government system um, in, 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 around the world. And I will reiterate what my colleagues, um, Admiral Kirby and Kareen said, that the, a prosperous and strong democratic Pakistan is critical to U.S. interests. That remains unchanged. Uh, but on some of these areas, such as press freedom, human rights, things of that nature, uh, we have consistently raised these issues uh, with our counterparts, not just in Pakistan, but in other countries where uh, we have a perspective to offer on that. But to give you some examples, what the United States is interested in is, you know, we look are looking to continue to strengthen uh, economic ties uh, between our two countries by expanding private sector trade and investment. And uh, there's also an important security collaboration and areas of collaboration on renewable energy, addressing the climate crisis, uh, increasing agricultural trade, and a number of areas. That's what we mean by a strong and prosperous and democratic Pakistan that is critical to U.S. interests. So how is it that it's stable Pakistan is of the interest if after the U.S. withdrawal, the Prime Minister Imran Khan was the Prime Minister at that time, the U.S. President did not call him about it. Then he gets shot. The president does not call him about it. Are you, which withdrawal are you referring uh, to? Oh, from the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Got it, at got that it. time, Imran Khan was the prime minister. Uh -huh. I mean, President Biden has a, is, is known for a long time in uh, expertise in foreign I, policy. I, I'm certainly not going to um, get into a, a tit for tat of okay. uh, who's called Just what or when. Uh, what I will say is that uh, uh, Pakistan continues to be an important uh, partner in the region, an important trade partner, an important security partner, uh, and even uh, in that time period, uh, we continue to engage uh, with our Pakistani counterparts on, on a number of issues. Okay, just one different one. Sure. Uh, Prime Minister Modi is coming to uh, uh, the U.S. next week. Uh, the same podium uh, I had asked Mr. Kirby again uh, when he was coming here during President ba uh, uh, President Obama's days. That was President Modi's first time coming to the U.S. Um, after being rejected U.S. visa for 20 years. Now he's coming again. This time President Biden had said in his elections day that he will raise the issue of Kashmir with them. He will raise the issue of how minorities are being treated in India, especially the Muslims, especially how the journalists are being treated under his leadership. 
So my question is, is President or the Secretary going to raise this issue with him over here, or no, they're going to be... Uh, first, uh, I think you meant the visit is next month, not uh, oh, not yeah, next, next week. Um, uh, secondly, uh, we very much look forward to hosting uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, and uh, uh, members of the Indian government uh, at this uh, next upcoming state visit. Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of what's going to be discussed, uh, but we have an important uh, partnership uh, with uh, India. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to take steps to deepen that. Uh, and uh, this uh, next state visit will be an immense opportunity to talk about a number of shared priorities, including addressing the climate crisis, addressing trade issues, uh, deepening our security cooperation, and a number of other areas as well. Ukraine. All right. Uh, I'm going to go to, then I'll go to you, Rob. Michelle, go ahead. Of uh, U.S. lawmakers introduced a bill today uh, to bar the U.S. government from recognizing uh, the Assad uh, regime, uh, and the bill moves to expand the Caesar. Did you say to bar recognition? Yes. Okay, go ahead. And yeah. the bill moves to expand the Caesar uh, Act uh, and asks the administration to be more aggressive in implementing it. Any reaction to that? And is the administration ready to implement Caesar Act? against the Arab countries who normalized with the Syrian regime? Uh, I, I just general, as a general matter, uh, I'm not going to get into uh, pending uh, or active legislation, but what I will say is that that is uh, already our policy. We have been very clear that uh, we do not seek to uh, normalize uh, relations with the Assad regime, uh, and we would not support our allies and partners doing so either. Uh, and so that is already uh, the posture of uh, the United States. Uh, as it relates to any actions, uh, I'm just not going to preview them from here, Michelle, but uh, when it has come to holding the Syrian uh, regime accountable, when holding members of the Assad regime accountable, we have not hesitated to take actions and take steps, including through um, uh, the Caesar Act. Uh, Rosalind, go ahead. Uh, on, okay, can I? Someone has one more yeah, Syria. Yeah. Sure. Syria, go ahead. I think that the Assad regime will gain more support from the Arabic countries and also from the, some EU countries. Will that impact on your military presence in North West Syria in the short or medium term? Uh, I don't have any posture assessments to, to, to offer from here. But what I will say, and I spoke about this earlier this week on Monday, I think, um, as it relates to our efforts in the region, one of our key priorities will continue to be, despite uh, what our partners in the Arab League uh, may choose to do or not do, one of the United States priorities in conjunction with our partners in the Arab world is to ensure that the steps that we are taking for the degradation of ISIS and the influence that they have in the region, that the work that we are doing uh, continues and persists. Um, and I will just point that in uh, since this administration has been in his office, we have been able to take two ISIS leaders uh, off the battlefield, uh, and we've continued to take steps to degrade uh, ISIS's influence in the region. And so that will continue to be our priority uh, for this part of the world, uh, irregardless of uh, what happens uh, else. I have another question on Iraq. Can oh, I, I'll, I can come back to you okay. after. Go ahead, Zelensky, on Ukraine. Zelensky said uh, today that he doesn't feel that his country is ready for the spring counteroffensive and this comes just a couple of days after the U.S. announced another tranche of uh, military equipment and support for the Ukrainian army. Does the U.S. government share Zelensky's assessment that now isn't the time for them to mount a counteroffensive? And if so, why? If you disagree, why? Rosalind, I'm just not going to get into prescriptive battlefield assessments from up here. Uh, what I will reiterate, and this is something that you saw the Secretary talk about in uh, his uh, engagement earlier this week with uh, Foreign Secretary Cleverly, uh, and yesterday with uh, his counterpart uh, from Spain, uh, the, the U.S.'s role uh, will continue to be to ensure that our Ukrainian partners have the assets, uh, the training, uh, and the pieces that they need uh, to ensure that they can defend defend their territorial integrity, defend their sovereignty, and reclaim uh, the top 
the territory that was taken from them. Uh, there has been a group of more than uh, 50 countries that, of course, that have come together to provide support to Ukraine. Uh, that has included the United States, and this is a uh, coalition of countries. Um, I will le let it leave it to the Ukrainians to speak to their own uh, next steps and to their own assessments of the battlefield. Uh, but the United States will continue to stand with our Ukrainian partners uh, as they um, as as they endure this. Is the U.S. having conversations with the Ukrainians about how to prepare for the day when there is some sort of peace negotiation? Is the U.S. stressing to the Ukrainians that they can't fight forever? Uh, Rosalind, again, I'm just not going to get into the specifics of, 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 of diplomatic engagements. Uh, even President Zelensky has been clear-eyed and vocal about the fact that uh, the resolution of this needs to happen uh, through peace and through diplomacy. Uh, but let's not forget that that could happen uh, at any minute if the Russians indicated that they were uh, willing to engage in good faith. Uh, they have not. The, Russia could end this war uh, right now if they wanted to by withdrawing their troops uh, from Ukraine. Uh, they again have chosen not to and instead have taken steps to further their strikes and to further their uh, violence and attacks that have targeted uh, civilian and energy infrastructure uh, across Ukraine. So uh, we will continue to take steps to ensure that our Ukrainian partners are in the best position possible to defend themselves uh, and to uh, reclaim the territory that was taken from them. Uh, Shannon, go ahead. One more question on South Africa, if I can. Yeah. If the State Department does come to the assessment that, in fact, arms were transferred to Russia, if that concern escalates, will there be penalties that they face? Because when the administration was anticipating that China might supply lethal aid, it was made very clear that they would face swift consequences. This is, I'm just not going to uh, get into a, a, a hypothetical, Shannon, but we have uh, not parsed our words uh, as it comes to any country uh, taking steps to support uh, the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, but again, I'm not going to uh, get ahead uh, of anything right now. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I will ask us from coming G7 uh, leaders yeah. meeting in Hiroshima. Yesterday, uh, President Biden touched on the possibility of uh, attending G7 summit virtually, uh, depending on his negotiation with Congress on debt ceiling. So I'm wondering if State Department is having any discussion with uh, Japanese government or other G7 members countries uh, regarding this possibility. Uh, look, I'm, I will let the, the White House speak to the, the president's own um, uh, travel schedule. Um, uh, I just don't have anything else uh, to offer on that. We, of course, uh, continue to engage with our uh, Japanese partners on a number of issues, uh, including uh, the upcoming uh, G7 leaders meeting. Uh, the secretary had the opportunity to represent the United States at the foreign minister's level meeting, um, and I know that uh, the, the White House will be in touch about any uh, changes that may or may not take place. Uh, uh, as it relates to the president's schedule, but my understanding is that the uh, uh, plan is still uh, uh, on and will proceed as, as normally. Um, Nick, go ahead. The uh, deadline to turn over the Afghanistan descent cable is 6 p.m. today. Yesterday, Chairman McCall said he had no alternative but to proceed with contempt proceedings if he doesn't get it. Um, I know you commented on this earlier this week, but today's the deadline, so will the State, com State Department comply with today's deadline? Well, Nick, we will continue to uh, engage uh, with the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, and discuss with them on their uh, requests. As I have said before, uh, the department has already uh, offered a uh, classified briefing uh, and a summary of the descent channel cable as well as uh, the department's response. Uh, we believe that this uh, information has been sufficient uh, to meet what the committee has requested thus far. Uh, but we again will continue to engage with them uh, and I just don't have any uh, updates uh, to offer right now. Gita, go ahead. Thank you, Sam. Um, yesterday, Wednesday, the uh, president of the UN Human Rights Council appointed the Islamic Republic of Iran as the next chair of the council's social forum. And the topic for the next session when Iran's gonna be president of the chair is technology and human rights. Now. I'm not going to go into the past nine uh, months' developments in Iran, 
But given that the uh, United States spearheaded the expulsion of Iran from the human, UN um, Commission on the Status of Women, what do you think of this appointment? Well, Gita, this is obviously um, deeply uh, troubling. The appointment of the Iranian ambassador, the representative of an egregious, uh, consistent human rights violator, uh, to chair such a group uh, simply undermines uh, its already limited uh, usefulness. Um, as you might recall, Gita, the U.S. opposed the resolution that created the Social Forum in 2015, uh, noting at the time that it would serve uh, limited utility and uh, add unnecessary and additional costs. Uh, the U.S. has not participated in the social forum in the past and does not intend uh, to participate in the 2023 uh, session uh, either. Uh, but of course, we are uh, disappointed that the uh, president of the council uh, uh, made this decision. And it is not appropriate for Iran to serve in uh, a leadership position uh, on a body that is supposed to be uh, associated with the promotion and protection of human rights. Um, the Biden administration has, from the very beginning, sought reforms at the UN. Don't you think there should be a criteria for appointments like this, for employments in general or uh, elections even, that whatever country is being um, uh, put forward as a candidate should meet some criteria uh, to be eligible to hold that certain part, uh, post? Gita, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be prescriptive about uh, reforms from, from up here, but uh, as you know, uh, as someone who's followed this very closely, um, when we have seen uh, inconsistencies with uh, the makeup of various multilateral bodies, uh, the, and a recent example being this uh, Commission on the Status of Women, uh, the U.S. has not hesitated to take steps uh, to ensure that uh, the, the values uh, that uh, such a group is supposed to be working on uh, is consistent with the values of the uh, uh, make countries that are made up of its membership. Um, and so I will just leave it at that. Question, really quick. Side, go ahead. Uh, is there anything ongoing behind the scene or uh, overtly with the JCPOA? Where, where is Envoy Mali? Is he conducting any kind of talks with either signatories to the deal or anything? Can you update us? Said, as you know, President Biden uh, is absolutely committed to ensuring uh, that Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon. Uh, and as we have said repeatedly, we believe diplomacy is the best way to achieve that goal, uh, but have nothing to announce or, or nothing to share or preview at this time. Joseph, go ahead. Um, also on Iran and Yemen, there was a bipartisan bill introduced, I think, earlier this week on the Hill. Uh, calling for sanctions on Iran's missile and drone programs because of the uh, looming expiration of a UN resolution that expires in October um, on, on the UN, the UN missile ban on Iran, on, uh, on, on Iran expires. Is the administration, is the State Department looking at, at extending that, um, seeing as it expires in a couple months? Uh, I, I'm not going to preview or get ahead of any uh, actions from here, Joseph. Uh, what I will say is that as it comes to the Iranian regime and the malign influence uh, that Iran has had, and of course Yemen uh, and the role that they have played uh, in the uh, when it comes to destabilization in that conflict, uh, of course continues to be of immense concern to the United States. And so we will not hesitate to take action uh, in holding the Iranian regime accountable, but I'm just not going to uh, preview from here. And, uh, this morning, Special Envoy Lender King said that Iran was still smuggling weapons and drugs into Yemen. Uh, I mean, from this podium before, you guys have, have uh, stated or, or revealed those viola previous violations of that. Um, have you seen, can, can you elaborate on, on Special Envoy's comments this morning? Has there been any, any recent incidents that you can point to in terms of Iran smuggling uh, those weapons into Yemen. I don't have any uh, specific uh, metrics to offer from here, but uh, certainly you are right. We have not parsed words from this podium when it comes to uh, the destabilizing influence and actions that the Iranian regime has taken uh, in Yemen, and it continues to be uh, an area of deep concern to us. Uh, and we will continue to work through uh, UN-led efforts, uh, efforts uh, that we're un undertaking, of course, uh, with our partners in Saudi Arabia as well, uh, but we'll also continue to take steps to hold the uh, Iranian regime accountable uh, if and when uh, necessary. Simon, you've had your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, 
Yeah, this issue has come up before that um, some lawmakers, uh, including uh, Senator Durbin, um, have raised a, a question, well, criticizing the, the Pentagon primarily for uh, blocking the sharing of um, intelligence with the International Criminal Court for the, for the investigation into um, Russia's actions in Ukraine or in, you know, war crimes, alleged war crimes in Ukraine. Um, I wonder, it, as part of this, it, it was also seemed to be um, said that State Department is cooperating with the ICC. So I wonder if you could clarify, is State providing intelligence uh, to that ICC investigation, or is the uh, Pentagon's opposition to that um, preventing the entire US government from sharing uh, materials uh, that could be evidence in, in those cases? Uh, Simon, I don't have any uh, updates on this from when uh, this was last raised at the at the briefing, but uh, if you'll allow me, the U.S. Uh, of course strongly supports pathways to justice and accountability for international crimes uh, committed in Ukraine, uh, and we support a range of international investigations and inquiries into uh, war crimes and atrocities in Ukraine. This includes those conducted by the ICC prosecutor. Uh, it uh, includes the UN. UN Human Rights Council created International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine. Uh, it also includes uh, auspices through the missions under the Moscow mechanism uh, of the OSCE as well. Uh, international courts such as the ICC can play an important role as the part of international efforts to ensure accountability for atrocities. And the US will continue to take steps to empower organizations to collect, preserve, analyze, and disseminate open source and comprehensive information. Um, but I just don't have anything uh, additional to offer but, on this. But does that support, specifically regarding the ICC, does that support include sharing uh, what might be evidence? There is a, a, a number of uh, mechanisms in which we are working to support uh, international organizations who are working on the issue of accountability for these atrocities. I'm not going to get into the, the specifics of what those uh, partnerships and engagements are, uh, uh, but uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Um, a question, unless Alex wants to jump in on this. Uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, just, uh, just, I want to see if you had any comment about the... Um, the violence there. Sure. Obviously, this comes right after the secretary's yeah. discussions with the two uh, top diplomats. How do, do you see this as setting back the, the diplomatic process? Well, Sean and Alex, I guess uh, we uh, th th this kind of violence. We believe it undermines the progress made by Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, toward a durable and dignified peace. Uh, and we call on the leaders of, of, of both of these countries that when they convene in uh, Brussels on the 14th to a, to, that these two parties agree to distance their forces along the border uh, as discussed uh, by Secretary Blinken during their participation uh, of these negotiations that we hosted uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the beginning of May. Just follow up if you don't mind. Yeah. Sean, yeah. Um, does the Secretary view upcoming meeting on the 14th as a continuation of Washington dialogue, or that was a separate track? Uh, we, of course, we 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 see uh, we see the dialogue that we hosted as important positive steps, uh, in which we felt the two countries had the opportunity to engage on some important issues, see the other side's point of view, and uh, we believe that there continues to be a, a durable uh, path forward. We believe that there is a uh, peaceful solution to this. It's why we, from the secretary on down, have continued to be so uh, deeply engaged on this, but I'm not going to uh, get ahead of uh, these talks themselves. And I can't help but ask about Russia's uh, position on this, because your Russian counterpart today questioned the secretary's uh, optimism on uh, the results of Washington talks, and also she laid out, you know, the rules, uh, you say her standards, that you know, uh, there is no success outside of trilateral uh, agreement they had, which according to the local experts, is about facing a conflict, not solving a conflict. So how do you see Russia's uh, position on this? You know, Alex, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what my Russian counterpart says uh, from her podium. Uh, what I can say, though, is that as it relates to the, this very important issue of peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, it is something that this department will continue to remain uh, deeply engaged on. Uh, we believe that there is a clear path forward. Uh, we obviously uh, were happy to host uh, these two countries uh, at the beginning of May. Uh, we believe that those talks were fruitful um, and 
laid the groundwork for a continuation of these talks uh, uh, beginning in Brussels, uh, and we'll let that process play out. I'm going to work the room a little bit, Alex. Just very quickly, okay. to clarify, do you expect the Secretary's phone call to this side? I don't have any calls to, to, to preview or read out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, related to the Iraqi track of which uh, prevailed that the Hashd al-Shaabi popular mobilization force of paramilitary military I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing yeah. you. The comments related to the Iraqi budget, drafted budget, shows that the Hashd al-Shaabi, it's a paramilitary group's uh, umbrella, uh, which there are some prominent Iranian-backed groups are in this uh, Hashd al-Shaabi group, and they, their number in the past two years have doubled in size. And if the budget uh, passed, now it will give 2.7 billion to the Hashd al-Shaabi, which a part of these forces, they were working so hard to expel the US forces in Iraq. And then don't you have any concern about the future of the nature of the role it will play in the future in Iraq? Uh, th this is largely an internal uh, domestic matter for Iraq. I don't have an assessment to, to offer from here. What uh, we support is a stable, prosperous, and democratic and unified Iraq. Uh, we have a strategic framework agreement, and that remains the foundation of our bilateral relationship. But I don't have anything else to offer. Go ahead in the back. Andrew Thornbrook of the Epoch Times. Yeah. I actually have two questions, both about ASEAN. Uh, so this week, ASEAN announced that it seeks to strengthen cooperation with China, including hastening the development of a cooperation agreement regarding behavior in the South China Sea. Uh, two questions on that. One, what is the administration's hopes, if any, that China will adhere to the tenets of such an agreement? And if the agreement is solidified, how will the capabilities, the maritime domain awareness capabilities that the U.S. provides to ASEAN be used to enforce it? What I will say is that uh, I, I've not seen this reporting, but what I will just say, and you've seen us talk about this uh, before, uh, is that as it uh, relates to the South China Sea, uh, there is important uh, work uh, being done as it relates to uh, maritime boundaries and international uh, delineation. Uh, we believe that there is uh, an important space for those kinds of uh, talks to continue to have some kind of framework uh, and rules of the road uh, as it relates to uh, that uh, that part of the world, but I don't have uh, anything else to offer. Uh, all right, I can probably do a couple more. Rio, go ahead. Um, today, White House announced a meeting between National Security Advisor Sullivan and Chinese official Wang Yi uh, happened in Vienna. And at the meeting, do you think there were any progress on the future engagement with China, including possible phone call between President Biden and Xi Jinping and the possible Secretary Blinken's visit to China? Well, these, uh, these talks between um, National Security uh, Advisor Jake Sullivan and um, uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Commissioner uh, Wang Yi, uh, they are part of ongoing efforts to maintain and open lines of communication and responsibly manage competition. That continues uh, to, to be the case. And as you've heard the Secretary say previously, uh, we intend to uh, get this trip uh, back on the books when uh, conditions allow, and we'll continue uh, to work uh, through that process. Process. Um, go ahead. Earlier today, uh, Secretary Nancy Pelosi described the Wagner Group as a terrorist organization. Is that an assessment of the chair? Uh, we have been very clear in our designation of the of the Wagner Group as a uh, group that is a uh, transnational uh, threat group. Uh, again, our assessment of the Wagner Group is that they are motivated by uh, profit, uh, not necessarily. Fame and some of the other uh, metrics and assessments uh, that are made uh, in an FTO process. That being said, um, uh, the processes as it relates to designations, uh, those processes continue to be ongoing, and uh, they are not some kind of uh, moment in time um, snapshot. So I don't have anything uh, additional to offer on Georgia. Go ahead. Georgia, Russia has lifted the visa regime and and um, direct flight ban with uh, Georgia. There's only basically concern on your end that this might add up. To Georgia's sidestepping of sanctions. Look, uh, Alex, the, the many Western countries, including the U.S., uh, prohibit Russian aircraft from entering uh, their airspace. Uh, if direct flights between Russia and Georgia resume, we, of course, would be concerned that companies at Georgian airports uh, could be at risk for sanctions if they service aircraft subject to import and export controls. 
uh, the entire Western community has distanced itself from uh, the Russian regime, and now is not the time for any country to increase its engagement with Russia. Uh, the people of Georgia would likely prefer that President Putin withdraw Russian troops from the 20% of Georgian ter territory that Russia occupies, rather than see direct flights uh, restored or uh, the visa regime changed. All right. If I also correctly, you call on Georgia to align with the sanctions against Russia, right? Uh, again, it would be of of of, of deep concern uh, to uh, companies uh, at uh, Georgian airports should uh, flights between Georgia and Russia resume. Right. Thanks, everybody.